Hello everyone, welcome to Ambari's very first Live from the Deep stream. You are going to be looking at live video from Ambari's remotely operated vehicle, Doc Ricketts, which is currently at Sir Ridge, where the water temperature is 3.4 degrees Celsius right now, which is a balmy 38 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm Hannah McDonald, your host and an intern at Ambari this summer. And together we're going to visit Sir Ridge, a deep sea rocky outcrop teeming with life located within Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, just off the coast of Big Sur. Right now, researchers from Embari and the sanctuary are exploring an underwater oasis at Sir Ridge, home to deep sea corals, sponges, and much, <coughs> much more. I'm super excited to get you on board Embari's research vessel, the Western Flyer, where we're going to be exploring these beautiful gardens and talk with the scientists about the work they're doing at Sir Ridge. We're also going to get a lesson on how to pilot a remotely operated vehicle, so stay tuned. Let us know where you're joining us from in the chat. This is also where you can type in any questions or comments you have for our exploration team. I'll give you a few seconds to type in your response. Let's check in and see where some folks are joining in from. It looks like we have people tuning in from Monterey. Ooh, from Hamburg, New Jersey. And let's see, keep them coming in. And someone from Salinas, California as well. Fantastic. Just a quick heads up, our live stream today is accessible to non-English speakers as well as deaf and hard of hearing audiences. We're incorporating American Sign Language and closed captioning in 15 different languages. All right, before we head out to sea, let's check in with George Matsumoto, Senior Education and Research Specialist here at Embari Headquarters in Moss Landing, California. Hey, George, thanks for being here today. Hi, Hannah, it's great to see you. Yeah, thank you. I was hoping to start off, you'd be able to tell us a little bit more about Embari's unique location. I would love to do that. First of all, it's important to recognize that Embari is located on the land of the Huenarin and Guacharon peoples represented today by the Amamutsun Tribal Band. This area was home to a settlement called the Lakoiosta in the region of Kalenderuk, which means ocean home place. As an Ambarian, I respect this history and feel very grateful to be in this special place. We have such amazing access to the deep ocean. Monterey Bay is right beyond these windows. Remember, there's only one ocean, and that one ocean represents the largest habitable ecosystem on our planet. It supports an astounding diversity of life. The coral and sponge gardens of Sir Ridge are a great example of that diversity. But we know so little. This is so exciting to me. Less than 5% of the ocean has been explored. And only about 15% of the seafloor has been mapped. We know more about the surface of Mars. And much of what lives in the ocean has yet to be revealed. There's so much left to learn if you are interested in the ocean. In fact, and Bari was established to develop innovative technology to help us better explore and study the ocean. We helped spearhead the use of ROVs, remotely operated vehicles like dock rickets, and AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, to explore the deep ocean and understand how it's been impacted by threats like climate change and plastic pollution. That's fantastic. I'm looking forward to learning more about AUVs and ROVs today. So I know that accessing the deep is notoriously challenging. What really does it take to get down there? Well, it takes teamwork. And as we'll see, scientists, engineer, and engineers, and the ship operations team, our marine operations team, which includes our ship captain, Andrew McKee, and ROV pilots like Knut Brecky and Ben Irwin, and science communicators like us, really have to work together to explore the ocean. Yeah, that sounds like it takes a team effort. And so you're exploring Monterey Bay. What makes this place so special? Um, well, this area, Monterey Bay, is home to an amazing diversity of life. And for anybody who's interested in following this type of career, Embari offers a summer internship program for students and educators who are looking to get their feet wet. And yeah, speaking of which, we're <coughs> going to talk to an intern later on in the show to learn about all the different types of career paths. Uh, one more question for you, George. Really, what makes this place so, so special? 
Well, it's hard to tell by, just by looking at the surface, but Monterey Bay is home to Monterey Canyon, a submarine canyon that stretches far down below the surface of the ocean. And as we're working in that, it provides Ambari researchers and all of us tuning in today a glimpse into the wonders of the deep ocean. The Western Flyer will be out at sea for six days, four days specifically exploring Sur Ridge. And depending on the weather, it takes about three and a half hours to get out to Sur Ridge, traveling at about 10 knots, which is about 11 miles per hour. Once the Flyer reaches Sur Ridge, the team will deploy Ambari's ROV, the Dock Ricketts, to explore the area. Sur Ridge is about 1,200 meters, or a little over two-thirds of a mile down, so it'll take about 45 minutes for the Dock Ricketts to travel to the bottom. Wow, that is really deep. That's like taking an elevator 250 floors to get to the bottom of Sir Ridge. Thanks so much, George. <laughs> that reminds me, let's take a look at this animation we made that drains Monterey Bay so you can actually see Monterey Canyon. This will give you a sense of the place where about the Beneath the beautiful blue waters of Monterey Bay lies a geological feature as majestic as the Grand Canyon. Just offshore of Embari in Moss Landing, California, Monterey Canyon provides our researchers quick access to the deep ocean and the chance to observe the amazing creatures that live there. If we were to drain Monterey Bay, we would see the main canyon channel meandering for over 470 kilometers. It's roughly 12 kilometers at its widest point. The canyon walls reach a maximum height of about 1,700 meters. Ambari researchers use AUVs, autonomous underwater vehicles, to explore and map the canyon. The AUV data shown here is one meter resolution. Monterey Canyon eventually ends on the abyssal plain at a depth of 4,000 meters. It is the largest submarine canyon on the Pacific coast, and Ambari is incredibly lucky to call it our backyard. Now that's a very special backyard. It's amazing to think that there's a blue Grand Canyon right out there. Monterey Canyon is part of a larger special marine area, Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. With me, I have Dr. Andrew DeVogelaire, research ecologist and one of the key researchers who's been diving on Sir Ridge. It's fantastic to have you here with us, Andrew. Great to see you, Hannah. So what made you first curious about Sir Ridge? Well, I have a, a map of the seafloor up on the wall of my office, and I've been looking at this distinctive feature called Sir Ridge for a long time. We'd been to Davidson Seamount, which was pretty spectacular, so I wanted to go there and check it out. And the opportunity arose when Jim Barry and I, he's, I think you're going to be talking to him next. We are. Um, we finished a day early on another project, and Jim said, hey, let's go check out Sir Ridge. We dove down 4,000 feet. The first animal we saw was a precious coral. We saw one coral after another, um, that whole dive. We knew it was a special place. And it's just kind of thrilling to talk about it, to talk about when you get to be the first human eyes to see something. And as George was saying, there's so many more places in the ocean where other people can still do that. That's fantastic and pretty inspiring. So Sir Ridge is in a sanctuary. Right. Yeah. You work for the sanctuary. Yeah. Can you tell me, what exactly is a sanctuary? <laughs> Well, in 1992, um, Congress decided that the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary off the coast of Central California was an area of national significance that should be protected for future generations. Um, the public had been trying to inform the Congress about this by telling them about the diversity of habitats. We have estuaries, rocky shores, kelp beds, sandy beaches, open ocean, canyons, as you saw. We have ridges and we have seamounts. So it's spectacular for its habitats, but the animals knew that even before the humans. We have sea turtles that are swimming from Indonesia across the Pacific to eat our jellyfish here. We have seabirds that migrate from New Zealand to come to Monterey Bay, and we even have the largest animal to ever roam the earth, uh, the blue whale that comes to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So we have 15 sanctuaries across our nation. The most recent one was designated just this year. That's awesome. I'm super excited to learn more about all of these special places with Jim in a bit too. Yeah. But 
Sir Ridge, it's significant within the sanctuary on its own, right? An ecologically significant significant area. What does that mean within the sanctuary? Right. So the sanctuary is a special place, but Sir Ridge is even a little bit more special. And that was designated when there was a West Coast wide effort to assess the impacts of bottom fishing uh, to the seafloor. And the fishermen, scientists, and um, conservation folks decided that, yeah, we should set Sir Ridge aside because it's got these spectacular deep sea corals that are like the old growth forests of the sea. And they can be impacted by fishing. So they were going to be set aside for that. And uh, fishing could be allowed elsewhere. It's teeming with life, but it's also special because Mbari can get out there two or three times a year, and it's then become a model for research and resource protection. So a lot of things going on at Sir Ridge. Yeah, speaking of Mbari getting out into the sanctuary, there's a really interesting project collaboration going on between the sanctuary and Mbari that has the ambition of protecting corals worldwide. Could you tell me a little bit more about this restoration project? That's right. Not, not for you and I, Hannah. We know that they're deep sea corals, but for a lot of people, deep sea corals are out of sight, out of mind. Right. We know that shallow water corals in the tropics can get damaged, and there have been techniques developed to, replace, to bring those, those uh, reefs back to life. But um, the deep sea corals can also be damaged. I mentioned fishing, uh, climate change, ocean acidification can impact them. In the Gulf of Mexico, there was a big oil spill that, that uh, killed a lot of the corals. And so we're developing ways of snipping small branches off of these ancient corals, bringing them to the surface, treating them, and then bringing them back to an area that's been disturbed so that they can grow and release their eggs. Um, it's, it's still something's in progress. The aquarium's been working on it and developing their exhibit. And I hope that some of your viewers will take up this challenge because these corals can grow hundreds, even thousands of years. They're going to be out there much longer than I will be around. So um, I hope somebody else wants to take up our, our studies. I, I hope so too. I hope this program inspires them to do just that. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for sharing your story about your curiosity with Sir Ridge and the connection it has to the sanctuary and the greater ocean. Thank you so much. Uh, now that we have a little more context, let's head out to our research vessel, the Western Flyer. I'd like to introduce everyone to Ambari senior scientist, seafloor no. ecologist, and principal investigator of this cruise to Sir Ridge, Dr. Jim Barry. As Jim tells us more about the goals of this expedition, You'll be seeing live footage from our ROV's cameras at Sir Ridge. And don't forget to type your questions into the chat as we'll be getting to them shortly. Hi, Jim. Hi, Hannah. Welcome to the ROV control room on the Western Flyer. I hope you have a clear signal over the satellite. And we, the ROV group and I, along with some people from the sanctuary and our own group at Mbari, are sitting in the control room. We're about 4,000 feet above the Sir Ridge coral gardens and we're ecologists trying to understand what is it about Sir Ridge that's, uh, that makes it such a, a special place for corals? Why do they thrive here and not other locations? Is it oceanography? Is it biological interactions, predation or competition with species for space? So we're here trying to understand what goes on at Sir Ridge in part because it's so close. It's right in our backyard and we're able to get here regularly, whereas most researchers that want to go down and study deep sea corals can only get there once or twice and just get a short snapshot of what's going on. We're able to really take a close look at this and what we've done in order to, to address the issues here at Sir Ridge and what's going on is establish what we call the Deep Sea Coral Observatory. And that includes all kinds of sensors and cameras and, and samplers that allow us to get a much better picture of exactly what factors are influencing the lives of these corals. For example, we have current meters that measure flow across the, the ridge. We have sensors the temperature, or oxygen, uh, pH, the chlorophyll that's coming down from above traps, sort of like a funnel that capture marine snow or the sinking organic debris from the surface. I'll take a minute just to explain that. You can see these particles floating by right now. That's not sediment stirred up by the ROV. That's food sinking from above. 
Think about what it's like to live here for a few moments. Normally, it's totally dark, except for bioluminescence. As Hannah mentions, it's cold. It's about 38 degrees or 3 degrees centigrade. It's high pressure, 100 times that that you'd see at the surface. Oxygen concentrations are only about 10% of what you'd see at the surface. It's a little bit more acidic. So life's challenging here. There's also no photosynthesis, so all that food has to be imported, and that's what you see as this sinking flux of organic debris. Today we're here setting out what we call the deep sea coral cam and you can see it in the background back here. It's a time lapse camera system that takes a shot every minute and you can see the corals in the foreground that camera is pointing at us. Be the stars of the show during the next year because we can leave this out for an entire year and we have the deployment that we started a year ago during the COVID year if you want to call it that and we've taken the roughly 9,000 images from that deployment and compressed them into a one minute video that I'm going to be able to show you now and you'll see that coming up on your screen and it's going to be sort of a hectic um, presentation where you see the fishes coming and going, sea stars squirreling around left and right, and you even see the camera kind of shifting left and right as the currents actually tilt the camera because the currents are so strong. If you look carefully, say in the middle of that, uh, that pink gubblegum coral that you can see right in the middle, at, at times you can see the feeding polyps come out. It looks a little fuzzy and dark, and then they're back in at other times. And we've got an intern right now that is analyzing this video and those images to try and identify how does biodiversity change through the year? What animals are coming and going? It gives us a unique view of a year in the life of this deep sea coral garden. So we're, we're hoping to share with you more results from that as we learn more but this camera will be now deployed here for the next year and we'll come out in a year and pick it up and we'll have another view of these these coral stars that are that are in front of us now sir ridge is a special place but deep sea corals live all over the world and we are using this as a, a laboratory that will give us an understanding of what's happening here, but also what's happening about uh, in deep sea coral communities throughout the world. As Andrew mentioned, these are very akin to the old growth forests that you'd see on land. These animals that you're seeing in front of you, they are animals, they're colonies, and they grow just like trees. They form rings that accumulate year after year. And these colonies right in front of us are several centuries to even older than that. It takes um, at least a few centuries for them to reach a mature size. The one on the right here is at least a couple meters tall. And we don't know if it's oceanography that affects their success or, or predators that might crawl up on, on them and kill them. And having this unique setting here protected in the sanctuary allows us to understand more about the corals, learn more or what factors we can play a role in because we know that they're very vulnerable to trawling. They may also be highly vulnerable to climate change in the ocean, which includes global warming ocean temperatures, more acidic waters, and lower oxygen concentrations. Having this system here allows us to learn enough about corals that we can inform policymakers so that we can make decisions that will protect these resources for our children and their children. And we're just happy to be here today to help learn something about these corals and also share this with our public audience. So back to you, Hannah. Thanks for letting us explain a little bit of what, about what's going on. Thanks so much, Jim. I find the live feed so fascinating, and this is such interesting research. I'm looking forward to following the coral cam. Uh, let's take some questions from our audience. We've got one on, in yeah. so far, and that is how do deep sea corals get their energy if it's not from symbiotic photosynthesis? That's an excellent question, Hannah. They are deep sea corals, and so everyone thinks, oh, they're the same as what we'd see at the surface, but they're quite different. They're very closely related taxonomically, but shallow water corals live in sunlit surface waters and they have symbiotic algae living in their tissues that photosynthesize just like normal plants and then actually provide food for those corals. Down here there is no light that supports photosynthesis so these animals depend upon they don't have photosynthetic algae in their tissues and they depend upon organic debris that's flying by or small um, 
zooplankton or small animals that they can capture in their small tentacles. And if we were to zoom in on some of these corals, you could see those small polyps have small little tentacles, much like little tiny sea anemones, just like corals that you'd see in a coral reef. So they're depending upon this marine snow that you see filtering by. That is fantastic. That, I loved seeing you, the marine snow in the live feed. We have another question from the audience, and that's what other sea creatures can you expect to find around these coral corals? Well, they're... <clears throat> Good question, Hannah. That's one of the things that we hope to find out with this deep sea camera. And I can tell you already, and maybe you saw it in the time lapse video, all kinds of fishes come and go. And you can see one small fish in the foreground here, which is a, a, called a thorny head, that orange fish you see. In the front a few minutes ago, we saw a variety of other fishes. When we first landed the ROV here, when Canute flew in and landed, there was a large deep sea skate sitting here. And so we're trying to identify those animals in a couple ways. One is with this camera. Another is with ROV video transects, where we fly across the bottom and record video. And a third is a more, it's sort of an emerging technology in ocean science using water samples that we can then filter and look for in what's called environmental DNA. The DNA signatures that we can detect in the water itself because of sloughed cells or debris that's been leaving d their DNA in the water. That's fascinating. And we have one more question. What is the pressure that this ROV is experiencing at these depths right now? Well, the pressure at this depth, if you, th when we're sitting, I'll start with the surface. At the surface, we have one atmosphere of pressure. That's the weight of the atmosphere pressing on us when we're standing at the, at sea level. Every 10 meters you go down yep. is worth, is the weight of, a, of our entire atmosphere. So we're at about 1,200 meters. So that's about 120 atmospheres. So that's lots of pressure compared to the one atmosphere we experience at the surface. 1,800 PSI. Or in, All right, in thanks so per much, pounds Jim, per square inch. For letting us hang sure. Yeah, thank you so much for letting us hang out with you in the control room of the Western Flyer. We're now going to shift gears and talk about an exciting new project that aims to bring the deep ocean onshore. We talked with George about how ocean exploration is really a team effort. Another important part of this team is our education and outreach partner, the Monterey Bay Aquarium. They are hard at work at building a brand new exhibition, and we want to give you a sneak peek of what they've got in the works. But before we meet our guests from the aquarium, let's take a look back at our recent joint and Bari Aquarium cruise to Sir Ridge in preparation for the Into the Deep exhibition. Exploring the deep sea is so exciting. It's been my dream ever since I was a little kid. I could compare it to exploring outer space, except it's right here on Earth. Today we're off the coast of Big Sur in California and we're on top of a mountain. It might not look like it, but underneath the ocean is a giant mountain. As the water sweeps across the ocean floor and it comes up to this underwater mountain, it provides food and nutrients to anything that lives on this underwater mountain. And so sea mounts the world over, but in particular here on Sur Ridge, are filled with gorgeous corals and sponges that get huge, 10 feet tall sometimes, and bigger than I am. How's the weather looking? Okay. You guys okay for life? Yeah, guys. The purpose of our expedition today is to explore all the water that's above Sur Ridge up to the surface. And it's a particularly special body of water because animals like jellies and crustaceans and fish, they'll all congregate on top of these underwater mountains. And so we really could see some very unusual creatures today. We're going to Sur Ridge. I've never been there before. I'm really, really excited. And I don't really know what we're gonna find. We're gonna see some crazy stuff. Oh man. We're really fortunate to be out with the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, who's letting us use their resources to help find deep sea animals. 
The animals that we're trying to reach live much deeper than anyone can possibly scuba dive, so we need very specialized equipment to reach these animals. The ROV Dock Rickets is a large underwater science robot that helps us get down into these habitats and find these animals. It is lowered from this big ship, the Western Flyer, down into the deep sea and it's attached by a tether that runs up to all the monitors and controls in the control room. So we can sit up on the boat while the pilots fly the ROV through the deep sea. I'm excited to introduce our next guest, Megan Alasso. Megan is a curator of the new Into the Deep exhibition. Don't forget, Megan will be answering your questions, so please go ahead and type them in. Megan, I think I caught a glimpse of you in that video. What's it like to be out on an expedition, and is that what your day's like every day? Hi. It is so fun and exciting to be on an Ibari expedition. The days are really long, but because we never know what we're going to see, they go by really fast. And no, that's not what my day looks like at the aquarium. The primary role of my team is to care for the animals in our collection. Some of those are on display for the public to enjoy, and some of them are behind the scenes, like the animals that we're taking care of for the upcoming Into the Deep show. That's really interesting. So you mentioned this expedition. What exactly were you doing out there, and what are the collections used for? So the primary objective of this expedition was to collect animals we think we might want to display in our new upcoming show. There's not a lot that's known about deep sea animals, so we've been working with them for a little while now to better understand what their requirements are. That makes a lot of sense. So what's the importance or the significance of showing, showcasing the deep? It's important to us to showcase the deep sea because it's the least explored environment on our planet. In some cases, it's just a few miles away, and yet it feels like this very distant and mysterious place that has no connection to us or even to the rest of the ocean, and that's not necessarily the case. In fact, not all deep sea animals stay in the deep. Twice a day, the largest mass migration on Earth happens in the ocean. It's called the diurnal, mass mi diurnal migration, and essentially, as the sun sets every night, deep sea animals from tiny little zooplankton to much larger species rise from the depths to feed on where food is more abundant in shallower waters. And then as the sun sets or rises every morning, they descend back to darker waters where they can hide from predators with good eyesight. That's really interesting. And I'm just thinking back to how much pressure we know is down on these animals in the deep sea. What kind of challenges are you provided with when you're trying to showcase this in an aquarium? This show has a lot of challenges. We have an in-house team of scientists and engineers who have designed enclosures that can replicate a lot of the conditions that our deep sea animals need to thrive. Conditions like extremely low temperatures, uh, low pH, and even sometimes changes in oxygen concentration. Very, very interesting. It sounds like a lot of work. Megan, thanks so much for stopping by, but I think we have a few questions from our audience. I want to personally know, what's your favorite deep sea creature? I have a lot of favorite deep sea creatures. I think the one that comes to mind right now is the predatory tunicate. Uh, to me, it's just kind of the quintessential odd deep sea animal. It's a tunicate. It has a hood, kind of like a Venus flytrap that it uses to catch prey like amphipods and small shrimp. And it's just a wonderfully weird animal. That's really, really cool. Um, another question we have coming in from our audience is what type of environmental changes do you need to make to replicate these deep sea environments in the aquarium? Sure, yeah, we uh, can make changes to pH by uh, dissolving carbon dioxide into the water, which uh, creates carbonic acid, which can lower the pH. We also use a semi-permeable gas membrane that can strip uh, gases out of the water, and then we can re-inject them in at lower concentrations so we can replicate something like the oxygen minimal zone, which has a much lower oxygen concentration. That sounds really complicated, but impressive. Thank you again so much, Megan, for sharing your time with us today and introducing the new Into the Deep exhibit. Thanks, Anna. We're going to head back on over to the Western Flyer to meet Knut Brecky. As the chief pilot of Embari's remotely operated vehicle, or ROV Doc Ricketts, 
Knut has been helping Megan collect deep sea animals for the new Into the Deep exhibition. Knut, can you tell us about the ROV, what you do as an ROV pilot, and how you entered this field? Hi, hi Hannah, and hi, everybody. Welcome back to the ROV control room for the dock rickets. Uh, I'm sitting here alongside Dr. Barry in the pilot's chair, uh, and we're currently on bottom with the ROV at 1,252 meters deep. Uh, that's the live view you're seeing right now. So, Doc Ricketts ROV is an uncrewed submarine, uncrewed submarine, which can go to 4,000 meters deep, which is about two and a half miles down. Uh, that means we operate the vehicle from here inside the control room, and we're not actually inside the vehicle, which I can tell you is nice. Um, we're always connected by an umbilical, so we have the umbilical that goes from the vehicle all the way back up here to the ship. And that provides us all the power we need for things like our lights and the cameras, our propulsion, and all the instruments we need to, uh, to perform the tasks that we do for our scientists, like we're doing uh, this week out here at Sir Ridge. Um, the Doc Ricketts ROV is about the size of a small air short airport shuttle bus, so it's a fairly big vehicle. It has, uh, and it weighs about 11,000 pounds in air. Even though it's that heavy in air, in the water, it's actually positively buoyant. So that means it floats. Um, and we, so that means we actually have to use our thrusters or our propulsion to push us all the way down to bottom like we're sitting here right now. If I was to actually stop thrusting, which I'm going to attempt right now, you're gonna see in the live feed, you're gonna see the vehicle move around just a little bit. There we go. That worked, good. So <laughs> we can actually see the vehicle move around and we're actually holding ourselves here on bottom. Uh, we have many cameras on the vehicle. We can carry as many as 15. What you're seeing right now is the main camera and we fly by this camera, but we also, this is also the camera that we use for video uh, recording. We also have cameras that look up at our umbilical. We have cameras that look down. We have cameras in the, one of the manipulator arms. We also have cameras down the side of the vehicle that gives us a nice overall view of everything around us. And that's really important, especially when you're flying in an area here like uh, Sur Ridge with all these delicate creatures. We don't wanna run into them or bump into them, uh, especially if we can't see them on the main cameras. Um, the way we do this and the way we fly the vehicle, uh, Doc Ricketts flies through the water like a helicopter. Uh, we can move forward, we can move backwards, we can lateral left, lateral right, we can uh, turn left, turn right, and vertical up and down. Um, so that's how we move through the water, but most importantly, the vehicle can hover like a helicopter. So we can come in and actually find an area that doesn't have any corals underneath us or around us and come in and just very gently land the vehicle uh, in an area so we don't damage any of these uh, delicate creatures like we did uh, right now. Um, right now, or so, and to do this, I'm sitting in the uh, pilot's chair, and in my right hand, I have the main joystick, which makes the vehicle go forward, backwards, lateral left, lateral right, turn left, turn right, and then in my left hand, I have the joystick that controls the vertical, which I just showed you a minute ago, minute ago to, to lift off. Um, we also have a lot of different instruments on the vehicle. Uh, we have things like our manipulator arms. We have sample boxes and sample tubes for collecting uh, both biologic samples and things like rocks. We have uh, water sampling bottles to be able to bring back samples of the water from down here in the deep sea. And we have core tubes. And core tubes are used with the manipulator arm to reach out and actually push down into the sediment and give us a nice uh, sample of that sediment or that mud that we can then uh, put on the vehicle and bring back. Uh, we also have a lot of specialized instruments uh, that we use that are designed for specific tasks, like, like uh, a water mateable connector for the coral camera, which we used just yesterday as we set the coral camera up. Uh, this allows us to view what the camera of the coral camera is seeing up here in the control room so we can adjust the iris and the zoom and the focus and get it just right so when we unplug 
uh, from the uh, camera and it's going to take a picture. I think Dr. Barry was saying it takes a picture an hour, every hour for the next year. We really need those uh, images to be just right. Another instrument we have that's kind of specialized for work here is our uh, an O2 sampler. And we can reach with a manipulator and reach an O2 sampler out actually and put it like inside a sponge. And that sponge then we can read the oxygen that that sponge is actually using for its respiration. Uh, speaking of the manipulator arms, a lot of people like these. I'm going to have Mark Talkovic bring the main manipulator into the view. Um, with this arm, we can reach out and just gently grab a very small branch of the coral and then bring it back and, and put it in one of our sample uh, jars to bring back to the surface. Or like for the aquarium, and we've done this for Megan, reach out and grab a rock that a coral is on, bring the whole coral back into our sample box and bring it safely to the surface and then it'll go on to uh, the aquarium and possibly go into the into the deep exhibit. Um, lastly, you asked me how I became an ROV pilot. Well, I've been flying ROVs for almost 30 years. Um, I got my start in the offshore oil industry as a commercial hard hat diver. Uh, this is where I saw my first ROVs. They were pretty new in the industry then, used mainly for inspection work on oil rigs and pipelines. Um, but like most people seeing ROVs, I thought they were pretty cool. And I transitioned into wanting to become a pilot. So I went from a hard hat diver to a ROV technician, to pilot, to ROV supervisor. And then 21 years ago, uh, I was offered the chance to come to Ambari to fly ROVs for science. And well, I've been doing that ever since. Seeing the ROV working live was so cool. We are so glad to have you show us the seafloor. It looks like we have some questions coming in from the chat. And that first one goes off of what you just said about your experience. What type of training does it take to become an ROV pilot? Well, Hannah, we, uh, there's kind of two sides of uh, ROVing uh, to get into the industry and they're highly electronical vehicles and software driven vehicles. So uh, electronics and software background. Uh, the other side is mechanical. Um, a lot of mechanics on these uh, mechanical items on this vehicle that need to repair. So the pilots not only fly the ROV, but we also work and repair the ROV. Um, and so it's really important to have one of those two aspects. And then um, you can, uh, there's, there are some schools around the country and around the world that actually teach uh, ROV basics and you can get into the industry that way. That's really interesting and you mentioned repairing. So you're flying the ROV, you're repairing it. We have a question coming in that asks what's a day in the life of an ROV pilot look like? Well, uh, I can tell you what we do here on the, the Western Flyer. Our morning starts about 6 in the morning when we start pre-diving the ROV. It takes us about 30 minutes. Then we, uh, about 6.30 in the morning, we open the what we call the moon pool doors or launch the ROV. Uh, and then from 6.30 till, uh, in the morning till about 6.30 at night, we're actually changing off with the uh, four different pilots flying the vehicle throughout the day, doing whatever tasks we need. Uh, and then in the evening, it's about 6.30 in the evening, we get the vehicle back up on deck, uh, and then we have some maintenance tasks to go through. As long as everything is working on the vehicle, uh, we get to go to bed uh, at an early time. If there's things that are broken, we tend to spend quite a few hours working on it so we don't lose a, another day to mechanical problems for our scientists. Well, I hope you don't experience any of those problems on this expedition. We have one more question <laughs> yeah, coming too. in from the chat. <laughs> and that is, what is a saltwater impact on an ROV? Oh, good question. Saltwater impact. So the vehicle itself, the frame, and most of the components are made of metals that uh, resist, to a point, corrosion from saltwater. We use uh, aluminum in the frames. Uh, we have uh, stainless steel in a lot of the connectors and some of the components. Uh, titanium uh, in a lot of our uh, underwater housings that we have electronics in. And so all those different 
uh, metals are less corrosive than, say, steel underwater. But also, because we have all these different metals that actually are in contact, uh, we, we use uh, sacrificial anodes on the vehicle, just like those people who know about boats that use sacrificial anodes. It is a, made of zinc, and those uh, corrode and go away instead of the parent metal, like the aluminums and the, and the uh, uh, stainless steels. Thanks so much, Knut. We've been talking a lot about the amazing creatures you can observe with an ROV at Sir Ridge. But in order to get a complete picture and understand the ecosystem as a whole, scientists and engineers need more than just images. That's where the mapping tool sled comes in. Check out this animation to see how we develop tools for larger scale research questions here at Ambari. Just a heads up, viewer discretion is advised as this animation has flashing lights and may potentially trigger photosensitivity reactions. Just off the coast from Mbari, countless mysteries await below the surface. One of them is named Sir Ridge. Sir Ridge stands over 500 meters tall and stretches over 20 kilometers long, roughly the size of Manhattan. Mbari is working to create maps of Sir Ridge to better understand this unique ecosystem. Ship-based sonars map large areas at 25 meter resolution and are good for navigation. Mapping at one meter resolution, autonomous underwater vehicles flying just 50 meters above the sea floor allow researchers to target areas of interest. In 2013, Ambari and NOAA scientists discovered an underwater oasis at Sir Ridge. At five centimeter resolution, you can clearly see the complex rock outcrops that create essential coral and sponge habitats. To study this hotspot, we needed to get even closer. So Embari engineers built a mapping tool sled and mounted it on our remotely operated vehicle, Doc Ricketts. The mapping tool sled is equipped with LiDAR, multi-beam sonar, stereo cameras, and strobe lights. The ROV carefully flies so that these sensors are always just three meters from the bottom. The sensors are mounted on a rotating frame so that they point directly at the surface they're surveying, even as the ROV traverses up and down rugged cliffs. Together, the sonar and LiDAR reveal the location and size of delicate deep sea corals, sponges, and other animals on the sea floor. One centimeter resolution, the ROV surveys are simply breathtaking. Bubblegum corals, like this one, can be hundreds of years old and as big as a king-sized mattress. These amazing images demonstrate what's possible when scientists and engineers work together to develop new technology for exploring the deep ocean. How fascinating that tools like the ROV Knut showed us can be adapted to bring us an even richer understanding of the seafloor. To talk a little more about deep sea technology, I have with me Lindsay Clausen. Like me, Lindsay is an intern at Ambari this summer, and their research team will be analyzing autonomous underwater vehicles, or AUV transects, to characterize water bodies. Hey Lindsay, it's great Hi. to have you here. Thank you, Hannah. I'm really excited to be here. Could you tell me a little bit more about how your team uses AUVs in the research? Definitely. Um, I guess I should start off with saying that I chose a really complicated topic. Um, so what I want to study are, is this intersection between physics, biology, chemistry, and geology in Monterey Bay. I know, big project, <laughs> and this is the kind of thing that would be really hard to accomplish and probably pretty expensive without these amazing tools such as AUVs. Um, so the AUVs that I use are different than the mapping AUVs in that um, they, can, they can go to the same area, they're programmed to do the same thing, survey a specific spot, um, but they use their sensors to gather information about the water column and they collect water samples um, rather than using their sensors to map the seafloor. That's really interesting. So they're quite a bit different than the mapping ones we just saw, mm -hmm. but how do you still use mapping in your research? 
Ah, that's good. Um, so that's the geology part that I hit on in the beginning. So the seafloor is really important when you're thinking about the physical mixing of the water. Um, so just a little bit of context, water out there is not all the same. Um, so there are density differences caused by the salinity and the temperature, and that's going to make some water masses that don't stay completely separate. They kind of mix a little bit. And one of the ways that they mix is by um, the seafloor, if any bumps or ridges that are present are really gonna mix that water up. It's kind of swirl and there'll be some processes that you're able to see in there. Um, so for my project specifically, pretty early on in it, um, I'm gonna be turning back to that data to find out if there was any features to sort out kind of any physical mixing that I see in my data set. Very interesting. And speaking about early in the project, early in our careers, I want to share a quick video with you about what it's like to navigate a career in STEM for our audience. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, and this clip is from Ambari's new Navigating STEM series, which will feature Ambarians talking about how they turned their love for the ocean into a career in marine science or engineering. This clip features Emery Nolasco, who until recently worked as an AUV engineer at Ambari. An AUV is an autonomous underwater vehicle, and essentially that's a underwater robot. What I do is I try to figure out how to stick things to things, how to place the sensors in the robot, or how to hold equipment on the robot. It's kind of like a big giant puzzle in some ways. We have so many questions, right? And if we only have one or two or three people coming up with the ideas, we're maybe not capturing all of the different perspectives. You're the person who's gonna ask those questions and bring those new ideas to the table. And the world needs that. The world needs you and your perspective and what you bring. Lindsay, we just saw that with Emery, it was a combination of being a tinkerer and doing art projects as a kid that really got her started. What was it that first sparked your interest? Uh, definitely my love of the water. Um, so the water is always something that I've said since I was a little kid. I grew up in Washington State um, at the bottom of the Salish Sea. That's that massive estuary they have up there. And there are a lot of really small waterfronts, um, just tiny beaches, lots of rocks and we called it the water and so we'd go there frequently and when I had the opportunity to really explore the Salish Sea in my undergrad career I jumped at the chance. Um, there was this course that just took us out on small boats, we'd grab some samples, take them back to the lab and analyze them and we'd take turns running analyses on things and at some point it was my turn to look at a sample um, to practice counting phytoplankton under the microscope and it's a really tedious pro process, uh, it's not for everyone but for me it was, it was really love at first sight. That's really interesting. And so tell me, you're, you're beginning your career now. What is one thing about it that you never really expected? Uh, touching back on that phytoplankton thing I just said, one of my official titles is phytoplankton taxonomist, which is something I would never expect for myself. Um, but now I bring it up in conversation constantly. Um, as my grad school friends can attest, I've worked it into every single one of our classes together. And I just think they're really cool and it's so important to learn about them. Uh, so shameless plug, I have a brand new science Instagram called You Can't Be A Serious. Um, if you wanna learn more about phytoplankton on there, please give me a follow, I'll be documenting everything. And you can't be a serious, is that a pun? It is a pun, there's a plankton called you can't be a zodiacus, it's really pretty and I'll have to post a picture on there. Okay, I have to check this out. You can't be a serious on Instagram, I'm definitely gonna follow it. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Lindsay, for someone that's eager in their career, <laughs> how, what advice would you give them on getting started and then what are some of the steps that you've taken so far? Oof, those are both very good questions. Okay, so if you're in school already, I highly recommend trying to take some sort of marine related course just to see where it takes you. Um, I definitely wouldn't be here right now today if I didn't do that. I was just taking all kinds of science courses, thinking I was going to join the medical career, and uh, 
ended up, you know, really falling in love with this estuarine field studies course, and it was a lot of fun doing research. Um, something else is uh, community-based science. If you don't have time to take courses, you can't do something like that, like that's a really great way to get involved in research. It doesn't matter if you're on the coast or in the interior, there's a lot of projects available, and you contribute to real science when you're doing that. It's awesome. That sounds like great advice for anyone that's interested. And anyone in our audience today who's interested in pursuing a STEM career, drop us a note in the chat and let us know what fields interest you. Thanks so much for sharing your time with us today, Lindsay. Thank you. All right, this team has really shown me how science, engineering, marine operations, and outreach come together to allow us to see this close by yet far away world. The partnership between Ambari, the Sanctuary, and the Monterey Bay Aquarium allows us to protect and conserve this special area while continuing to explore, understand, and share access to the deep and unique places like Sir Ridge. We hope you enjoyed visiting the Deep Sea Coral and Sponge Gardens and meeting our team today. You can stay up to date on all of Ambari's expeditions on social media. Let us know what you thought about the show and what deep sea research and technology topics you'd like to learn more about. Finally, as we close, I'd like to play some ocean sounds for you, courtesy of our hydrophone. See if you can guess which marine mammal it is. This underwater microphone is located about 32 miles offshore at Ambari's deep sea observatory called MARS, which stands for Monterey Accelerated Research System. If you like what you can hear, you can live stream this hydrophone anytime, day or night, using the link we post in the chat. If you're lucky, you'll get to eavesdrop on dolphins, orcas, humpback whales, and much, much more. With that, we hope you always appreciate the global ocean and our window into the deep. Thanks for tuning in and see you next time.